Welcome to these online lectures regarding the phylum Cnidaria. And in this first lecture, I'm going to talk about the class Cyphozoa. Remember that the class Cyphozoa has both medusa and polyp forms, but that the medusa is definitely the most prominent or dominant form in this class. And we'll talk a little in a little bit about the cycling. Um, so uh, one of the things that's obvious about the medusa of the Cyphozoa is that they have a really thick mesoglial layer between the epidermis and the gastrodermis. Okay, all cnidarians have a mesoglea, but in the Cyphozoans, the mesoglea is particularly thick in the medusa form. Cnidarians have a beautiful diversity, and certainly within this class Cyphozoa, there are many different species of jellies. I'm just showing you another picture here, but I really encourage you to perhaps go to Google Images and just type in Cyphozoan jellies or even jellyfish and just look at all of the uh, amazing range, um, range of jellies that there are um, on the planet. And um, I also encourage you to take a look at the reef guides that we have in the classroom. In the Cyphozoan medusa, you see this big um, bell shape that forms the main body of the animal, and that the tentacles are actually present around the edge of the bell. Here you can see these in this particular photograph. And in addition to tentacles, uh, Cyphozoan medusa also have these long oral arms that surround the mouth. Okay. Another feature of these guys is that the gastrovascular cavity is um, divided into four what are called gastric pouches. Okay, so you can see the gastric pouches in this sort of top-down view. So here's kind of a side view of the medusa, and here's kind of looking one, at one top-down. And in lab, you'll see some uh, preserved examples of uh, some of the uh, jellies that we have there. Okay, another thing about the gastrovascular cavity is that um, it extends into these radial canals so that when food comes into the mouth and is digested within the gastrovascular uh, cavity, that it then is um, distributed into the radial canals. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about how that digestion takes place uh, in just a moment. So here we have a close-up of one of the, uh, sort of half of the jelly here, and you can see two of the four gastric pouches. And what's, um, which seems sort of unusual here is that the, the gonads are also present within these gastric pouches, and so you kind of have feeding and reproduction. Remember I talked about in class how um, cnidarians have to do a lot with a little. <laughs> okay, So food enters into the mouth region and um, is then sort of taken up by these uh, gastric filaments. So the gastric filaments that are present actually on the ends of the gonads secrete these enzymes, okay, and then they will uh, sort of capture, trap the food, and then phagocytize the food that's partially digested already. And then the rest of digestion actually occurs intracellularly. Okay, so um, similar to what we saw in the peripherans, we have intracellular digestion. And as we'll see later in the semester, uh, we start to see um, digestion happening extracellularly later on. But for now, we still have this more sort of primitive way of digesting food, which is intracellularly. So these gonads are... Um, also responsible for producing gametes, okay? And so the um, gamete-producing tissue that resides within the gastric pouches, um, once they produce gametes, they'll be released through the mouth. And so the gastrodermis serves both a reproductive and a digestive function. So cyphozoans have these interesting structures called ropalia, which is the plural form for ropalium. This is a singular. And these are tubular structures that are used for balance. Okay, so they have these specialized sensory structures. And here's kind of a close-up on one of the ropalium. And you can see this um, statolith, sometimes called a statocyst. And what happens is when the animal kind of moves from one side to the other, 
the statolith is going to um, stimulate certain kinds of receptors on one side and um, give the organism a sense of balance. Ropalia can contain um, sensory structures that do a variety of things and um, in many cases you see an ocellus, which is singular for ocelli, present right here, and that has the ability to sense light and dark. So they can tell night from day by having this ocellus here. And then again, you can see the statocyst or the statolith, they're really the same thing. And, and here you see the sensory cilium, and when the animal has um, moved in a certain direction, it knows it's either uh, bent to the left or to the right or is upside down because of this balance function that the ropalia provide. I don't want to spend a lot of time going over the life cycles here in this online lecture. I do want you to explore this more in lab as you look at these different stages on the slides. But um, this is the life cycle for a common jelly called Aurelia. And um, uh, as I've talked about here, most cyphozoans are actually dioecious, right? Remember that dioecious means that there are separate sexes. So you're going to have, say, a female jelly and then a male jelly out there in the world, okay? So um, remember that the gonads are producing gametes. So this female here has produced some eggs, all right? And then this adult male here has produced some sperm. And of course, uh, fertilization here is taking place externally. So unlike in the peripherans where we saw an internal fertilization, we have gametes that are shed into the water and then you have fertilization taking place externally. Uh, eventually this uh, zygote will uh, develop into a ciliated planula larvae, which will settle down onto the surface and forms a structure called a cyphostoma. Okay, notice that when you see the word stoma, that refers to some kind of a map. All right, so this is a feeding phase. These guys have tentacles. Um, all right, so this is now where we're seeing the polyp. So we went from medusa to polyp. The feeding stage will, of course, take in food, continues to grow, sometimes bud. All right, and then eventually it starts to do what's called uh, strobilating. Okay, so this is sometimes called a strobola. Okay, and so what strobilating is, is that it starts to produce a whole stack of these little discs, almost like poker chips. And then so each one of these little discs will eventually butt off. So this is a way of rapid asexual reproduction so that you have uh, a single genetic animal that can produce many um, clones of itself. All right, so each of these little discs, which are called ephra, will butt off, okay, and each will eventually grow into an adult. So if this is a... Um, uh, female, it may become, uh, you'll have many, many female jellyfishes. And if this is a male, it will produce many, many male jelly jellies. So these terms here, um, genet, genet just means the genetic individual, okay? And ramet just means clones of, uh, of, a, of an individual. So you can have many different parts of a genetic individual, usually we think of a genet as um, staying all together in the same body, okay? Um, but for plants and many other organisms that can reproduce asexually and those pieces can break off, those are often referred to as the ramets. I want to end this piece here by just mentioning this class uh, Cubozoa, uh, which I'm again spending very little time on. And as you can see, um, in this particular class, they're similar to the cyphozoans, and so um, a bit more uh, related to them, but still in a completely different class. And you can see that this um, this cube-shaped uh, bell with four tentacles, okay, each of these have four tentacles, is characteristic of the cubozoans. And the other thing that's really characteristic of these guys is the fact that they have really highly toxic nematocysts. These are some of the most dangerous cnidarians on the planet. Um, some of them are called uh, sea wasps. Uh, some can be very, very painful. Some can be deadly. And some of these guys will feed on uh, small to medium-sized fish. So um, they don't have life cycles. They don't strobilate. That's one of the things that separates them from the cyphozoans. And that's all about uh, the time that we have to cover with the cubozoans. And so I'm going to end this lecture right here.